thank you and a very warm welcome uh, to everybody here with us in studio, as well as to those of you listening at home. That was the sound of uh, 50 people cheering, not for me, but for my guest this afternoon for the second hour of the show. As we set aside our usual uh, Tuesday afternoon programming for the chance to meet somebody who's been called many things. I've heard him described often as the human polar bear. I've heard him described as absolutely barking mad a few times as well. And uh, certainly you have to use words like passionate and committed. He was the first person to complete a long-distance swim in every ocean of the world, the first person to swim across the North Pole. He has literally swum every one of the seven seas. But I think dwarfing all of those achievements is the role he's played as a so-called speedo diplomat, and particularly in the last couple of weeks and months, securing protection for the waters of Antarctica. It's a, such a pleasure to welcome in studio Lewis Pugh. So great to have you with us. Thank you very, very much. And thank you again, although he is a man who swims in the very coldest of seas, you want to say the very warmest of welcome to those of you joining us in studio. It's wonderful to have you with us. And um, we're going to start by talking about what has happened around the Ross Sea. Uh, and if time allows towards the end, if you've got any questions about that process or about his previous achievements in swimming, if you'd like to know how he trains, what he eats, what fleece is in the sleeping bag, anything like that. Please keep your questions for our, our time we'll make uh, available at the end. And to those of you listening at home, please do join the conversation on the SMS line. 31567 is the number to use. You're also welcome to tweet your question at uh, Cape Talk or at PJC Hudson if you'd like to join the conversation there or send an email to pipah at capetalk.co.za. Now, uh, Okay, let's go back to last month. We heard that the Ross Sea had finally been declared a marine protected area and not just a protected area, the biggest in the world yeah. on land or sea. It's due in no small part to what you have done for the last couple of years, shuttling between nations, negotiating uh, individually, convincing everybody that the Ross Sea is more important as an ecosystem than it is as a fishing ground. We know it's been a long journey for you as an advocate for our oceans, but, but how did you actually find yourself involved in this particular role? Just, just to explain you know, what the Ross Sea is like, because I, I think many people would never have heard of the Ross Sea or where it is. If you sail from the bottom of New Zealand and you sail from 40 degrees south, 50, 60, 70, eventually on the horizon you will see the most incredible sight you've ever seen. You'll see the spiky mountains of Victoria Land of Antarctica. And then if you sail for another eight degrees south, you will get to the most desolate place on this earth, right deep down into the Ross Sea. And in front of you will be an enormous great ice shelf, about 100 meters high out of the water. And this is, it's the most remote place on this earth, and it is, it's bleak. But if I had just one last day left on this earth, it would be in the Ross Sea. It's an amazing place. Because around you is, it's like a polar garden of Eden. Mm. You've got these small little Adelie penguins, you've got the great big emperor penguins, you've got icebergs, you've got beautiful great humpback whales coming out of the water. It's truly amazing. But this place was under threat from fishing. And so the place had to be set aside as a marine protected area. I've heard it described as the most important natural laboratory left on the planet. It's the last pristine ecosystem of its kind where we can look at the world and look at what's happening to our planet. Well, that's exactly it. So scientists, there are two big scientific stations down there. There's the big American station and there's also one from New Zealand. Scientists come from all over the world there to study exactly what a pristine or a, a, a mostly pristine ecosystem actually looks like. There's no place in the world now which is not touched by man, but down in the Ross Sea, it's the least touched by man. And so they can see what a healthy ecosystem looks like and then make recommendations to governments about what we actually need to do to fix all the other places which we've damaged so badly. Mm. Now, obviously, you've spent years doing these extreme swims in mm. cold climates, in, 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 in far-flung places, to draw attention to precisely what we're doing to the other ecosystems that we've already all but destroyed. Mm. What brought you into this particular conversation uh, as an ambassador in this speedo diplomacy? Well, I, I mean, p people think that I've done a lot of cold water swimming, and certainly I have done a lot of cold water swimming, but absolutely nothing compares to what the Ross Sea is like. I mean, so when I swam across the North Pole, the water is minus 1.7, but the air temperature was about zero, okay? Still very, very cold. But down in the Ross Sea, it's on, it's on another scale. So the water is minus 1.7, salt water freezes at minus 1.8, but the air temperature is minus 37. So just wow. to explain what that's like, um, I put my, my safety crew into a small zodiac and I said to them, please go along the ice shelf. I need you to make sure that there are no leopard seals in the water. 
So they, because leopard seals are, are, are notoriously um, obstreperous. If you, when you're in the water... <laughs> they're grumpy. They're grumpy. And, and so they went up and down uh, the ice shelf, and then I saw them come back, and I saw a small wave hit up against the side of the zodiac. Some water came up, and it actually froze midair. Cool. So that's... So as a swimmer, all you're thinking about, okay, is I'm going to be in minus 1.7. I'm going to pull my hand out of the water. It's going to be into minus 37, okay? And as I swim in just a, just a speedo, okay? What, what made me want to go down there and risk absolutely everything? Because this is such a special place. And also because we stand at this monumental moment in history that unless we actually do protect these places, they will be gone forever. And these negotiations have been going on for 17 years. And every single year it's the same discussion and it, it just was going absolutely nowhere. And, and, and you need to do something to grab the attention and to try and grab the headlines. And there were two countries who were principally blocking the deal. They were China and they were Russia. And how do you get two countries who are in the northern hemisphere, and Russia especially, which always looks to the north, to the Arctic, how do you get them to understand that there's something happening on the complete opposite end of the world, which is important to them? Okay? And how do you do that when there's a war going on in eastern Ukraine, when there's a war going on in Syria, when there's sanctions up against Russia, when it's the last thing on their mind? So how did you do it? Well, I mean... you. It's an extraordinary journey, and you know, people say to me, well, how did you really believe that you could persuade President Putin that this was the right thing to do? I, I, and I don't know, but I just honestly believe that there was a big injustice occurring. And if I was able to present the facts properly and succinctly to President Putin, that he, he and the other members of the, of, of the Politburo would listen. The big injustice for me was... Not only that we are damaging our environment so badly that our children and our grandchildren won't have a future, but also that we were going down to this world, to the world of the emperor penguin, to the world of the humpback whale, and destroying their environment. They've lived there for millions of years. What gives us the right to go down there and destroy their world? Now, you took that message backwards and forwards over yeah. a period of two years plus, mm. shuttling between the parties, trying to win consensus, trying to find common ground, mm. as you say, in a fraught political environment, particularly between the US and Russia. Yeah. You were walking into the Kremlin on your own, trying to convince yeah. one of the most feared men on the planet that this was worth caring about. Why do you think your approach finally worked? What is it about that speedo diplomacy that worked? Uh, I was neutral. I was independent and I didn't have any agenda other than the fact that I really care about the environment. That was the first thing. The second thing is, I remember one of the Russian ministers saying to me, he said, you know, Lewis, you don't need to come here and tell us about the cold. He <laughs> said, all of us as young boys and young girls, when we were children, we, our parents would take us down to the lake or down to the sea, they'd cut a hole in the ice and we'd go for a swim. So we know what you've been through and we respect people who come here with courage. He also said something to me which absolutely fascinated me. He said, Lewis, you're not like a dog that barks across the road. You walk up to our gate, you knock on the front door, and you come and have a civilized discussion with us. So I think it was just a very, very different mm. approach. You know, Russia now is under tremendous pressure. It's under pressure not only from sanctions from the, uh, from the European Union, not only on sanctions... You know, the, the, these things are having a very, very big impact on Russia. They're feeling, I think, in, in a sort of lager mentality, everybody is up against them. And when somebody comes along and says, I actually think there's an opportunity here. There's an opportunity to really be leaders in protecting the environment. I mean, after all, it was a Russian, and this is a little known fact, it was a Russian that discovered Antarctica. So in 1820, it was an Admiral Bellinghausen sailed from St. Petersburg, sailed down and discovered Antarctica. And that's important to Russians. Of the, there the are 13 seas around uh, Antarctica, one of them being the Ross Sea. There are 13 seas, five of them are named after Russians. So, so mm. they have a huge history down there. They have more scientific stations than any other nation down there. I think they've got 13 stations. Okay? South Africa has one. Okay? So they have a, a tradition, they have an interest down there, but they had to be won over. They had to be persuaded. And in order to persuade somebody about something, you also have to listen to their dialogue and understand what the issues are going on in their world. Now, that conversation 
concluded successfully only in October. It's a couple of weeks back. You yeah. must still be pinching yourself and you must feel an incredible sense of personal pride in what you've achieved. It, it, uh, I was... I wanted to cry. The, the, the moment I got... The extraordinary thing is that a lot of these negotiations have actually been conducted over WhatsApp. Seriously. <laughs> and I got, a, and I got a, 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 a WhatsApp message from the Kremlin saying, on, on, on a Wednesday evening, stand by to stand by. That's all they said, stand by to stand by. And then I knew something was, ha was up. And, and, and when, when the New Zealand Prime Minister announced it, uh, it was... To, to, it's a historic moment in the history of conservation. It's historic because not only does it set a precedent, because this is actually the first large marine protected area in the high seas. Okay? The high seas represent 45% of the planet. Okay? We don't, so this is the first one in the high seas. The high seas are notoriously overfished, so what I'm hoping comes out of this is many more marine protected areas. So that's why it's so important. I think it's also important we mention the scale of this because it, oh. it's, it's the size of, of several large European countries combined, isn't it? Yes, so in European terms, it's the size of Britain, France, Germany, Italy all put together. In African terms, it's the size of South Africa and Zimbabwe put together. It's huge. Okay. Biggest reserve anywhere in the world on land or sea. On land or in the sea. It's enormous. And uh, we're going to continue talking about uh, some of the elements of those negotiations and some of the other uh, achievements uh, that he has secured using this technique of his speedo diplomacy. But first, a couple of questions from members of our audience. Uh, while we wait for those, just a reminder that those of you listening at home are welcome to join the conversation by sending an email to pippah at capetalk.co.za or an SMS to 31567. You can also tweet us at Cape Talk. To the audience we go though, good afternoon. Hello, I'm Sonia Rees from Camps Bay. Welcome Sonia. Thank you. Lewis mentioned that the outside temperature in the Ross Sea was sort of minus 37. Mm. What does he do to protect his skin and those parts of his body that aren't in the water? Um, you know, no human had ever swum in this water temperature before. It, it, it's, it's, it's absolutely terrifying. Uh, I'll, I'll never ever forget you know, just about to go into the water. And, and, and you have the, you know, the moments which challenge us the most in our lives really define us. And you've got a choice right then, whether you're going to go in and you're going to go for it and, 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 and pray that the team will look after you, or you're going to stay on the boat and then sail back to New Zealand. And I care so much about that place. Yep. I, I, I dived in, and I just swam as hard and as fast as I could. I didn't even notice that when I dived in, I lost my goggles. Sure. Okay? I just kept on swimming. Didn't even notice. And at the end of the swim, I, th I think I did about 350 meters. I had lost all feeling in my hands completely, and my hands were completely white. This hadn't happened at the North Pole. And I just said to myself, uh, before I got into the water, the captain of the boat was a Finnish captain. He said, make sure that you come out and that you're able to go to the Kremlin afterwards. <laughs> and so I, I, I swam for 350 meters. I don't think I could have gone on another meter. I climbed out and uh, got straight into a, a, a very, very hot shower for about 50 minutes. Uh, I, the short answer to your question is there's absolutely no way of protecting yourself from that type of cold at all. Yeah. You just have to tough it out. You, you've got to tough it out, yeah. Phenomenal. Second question from the audience. Um, my name's Jax from Hart Bay. Just um, with reference as, as well to the Ross Sea negotiations with Putin, um, in an interview with the World Economic Forum, mm. they asked you um, how you think you convinced Putin yeah. to change his mind, and this was your answer. I had a gut feeling it would work. I always thought that if the arguments were presented properly to President Putin, he would agree to it. He would see the justice and act. Being good at arguing doesn't make you a good negotiator. It is about persuasion, not debate. But more than putting a persuasive argument to them, I also listened to what they had to say. I didn't go in looking for a confrontation, but rather tried to find a point of mutual understanding. I think that made all the difference. Um, now with Trump just, I think last night, posting online a video to say that he's gonna lift the, the environmental bans or restrictions that Obama placed. Yeah. Do you think that you'll approach him? And if so, do you have a gut feeling of hope? And what would you say? I just knew I'd get this question. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the, the, the starting point is that America has voted in this election and the American public have spoken. And it's important to respect their views. 
and they have decided that that Donald Trump should be their president. Um, that's 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 the first point, and we are where we are. I will have to to work with him. Uh, in terms of Antarctica, there are 24 countries and the European Union which govern Antarctica, America being one of them. Now, here's the interesting point. It was the American government that proposed initially the Ross Sea to be a marine protected area. And so I was having to shuttle from the State Department to Moscow to get the Russians to agree. I think things are going to be different now. I'm going back down to Antarctica in two weeks' time to try and get another three marine protected areas down there. Collectively with the Ross Sea, the area will be about the size of Australia. And I envisage a situation where it won't be the Russians that I'm trying to persuade, but they'll have to be shuttled to America to persuade the Americans to get in on the deal with the Russians. This is geopolitics. I try not to take sides. The, the cards are dealt to me, and I have to work with them. Uh, what I would say is that anybody that thinks that climate change is not a reality, and I've seen the tweets by, by Donald Trump, anybody who's saying that climate change is not, a re is not real and it's a conspiracy by the Chinese, is, uh, they're not on top of the science, number one. Either that or they're being paid to say else, something else. Uh, climate change is an absolute reality. And what concerns me about Donald Trump's position is that you know, America are responsible for 16% of the world's greenhouse gas, gas emissions. Together with China, which is, I think is 22%, that's around about 40% of the world's carbon emissions are by two countries alone. If one of them tries to back out of the climate change agreement, which was signed exactly this time last year, I was there in Paris, if one of them tries to back out, what is the rest of the world going to say? It's, it's not a good position to take. The last thing that I would say is, and I'm speaking from a business point of view, it, it is such an own goal. There is such incredible opportunities now to produce renewable energy, and I would like to see America investing in this. It's a fantastic business opportunity now as we move from oil and gas towards renewables. Why on earth they wouldn't want to try and create business opportunities out of this and leave this all to the Chinese and other nations, I simply don't know. Great question, Jackie. And Keith was asking the same thing on SMS, but he adds a note, please not to give Trump a speedo. Okay. Okay. <laughs> if you've just joined us, my guest for our live studio audience is Lewis Pugh, uh, talking to us about the successful negotiations to secure the world's largest protected area around the Ross Sea and Antarctica. And he's going to be heading back there in just a few weeks' time. We will talk about that trip some more. Um, Vic, though, rightly reminding me on the email, saying Lewis did this while leaving behind his recovery from a very serious back operation. And I think we must uh, mention that fact. It was only May of this year mm -hmm. that you woke up feeling a little lame one day, a little bit worse the next day, and suddenly found yourself in hospital facing emergency surgery. Now, for somebody as active as you, whose mm -hmm. life has involved so much physical activity, that had to be an incredibly scary personal prospect. You must also have been worried about how it would impact on these negotiations. It was very scary from a personal point of view. I haven't spoken much about it, but, but, but two years ago, my half-brother died in surgery. And so, and I'd never had an operation before. Wow. So in 30 years of swimming, I'd, I'd, I've, I've never had any injury whatsoever. And, and I woke up one morning, and my back was very, very sore. The next day, I had some physio. Um, it seemed better the following day. My back was in agony. I went to go see an orthopedic surgeon, and he said, Lewis, he said, uh, you've, you've slipped your disc. It's very bad. Uh, I recommend we operate tomorrow. Ooh. And, you know, my, my, my father was an orthopedic surgeon, and he always used to say, you know, surgery, the knife is the last option. And, and so I said, well, let, let's see what happens. Let, let's do, you know, a week's rest, and let's see what happens. We, we did that, and then on the seventh day, I couldn't feel my one leg. And uh, I went to go see another surgeon to have a second opinion. He agreed with it. And then we had to choose a surgeon. And it was an extraordinary moment because you're putting, you know, for me, it's not just an operation, it's my whole career. You know, my back carries me through the water. Uh, they recommended I go see a man called Dr. Melville. Dr. Melville is 74 years old. I walked into his, into his office. He said to me, he said, Lewis, he said, uh, 
I need you to understand two things. The first is that, to be honest, I haven't done this operation in, in many years. Ooh. He said, uh, I did it when I was a kid. I probably did about 5,000 when I was a kid. He said, I'm a brain surgeon now. Uh, I mostly deal with people who have epileptic fits, but this is bread and butter. I can do it. He said, the second thing is, I'm 74 years old, Lewis. I need you to understand this. The third thing is, he said, I have a dog, and his name is Lewis. <laughs> and this dog is named after you. I said, <laughs> Come on. I said, really? He says, my wife breeds huskies, okay? And she has a husky, which was called Lewis. And the dog was born that was so sick that the vet called it a swimmer because he couldn't get up on his feet, and he was just lying on the okay. ground with his paws moving like a swimmer and the vet wanted to put it down and his wife Merle said under no circumstances do we put Lewis down and so they named him Lewis because he was a swimmer anyway the, short, <laughs> the long and the short of it was that Lewis then went on so Merle built a pouch she put Lewis inside it she looked after Lewis right next to her for about three months Lewis then went on to become South Africa's prize Siberian Husky oh. He said to me, he said, I understand that your half-brother passed away. He said, I'm going to operate on you tomorrow, and I will get you back on your feet soon. And the first person to come and visit you will be Lewis the Husky. So I thought, this is, you can't even, this is too surreal for, for, for words. <laughs> so I say, okay, you do the operation. I woke up out of surgery I had one day in high care. The next day I woke up and the, there was a big bang on the door and in walked Dr. Melville with this Siberian husky oh. who just jumped on my bed, licked wow. me, kissed me, and then proceeded <laughs> to run out and jump onto everybody else's beds. <laughs> I said to Dr. Melville, Dr. Melville, I need to go to uh, Moscow for a meeting in two weeks' time. He said to me, I recommend... 10 weeks of rest. I said, I need to go to Moscow in 10 days' time. He said, I'll get you on the plane. And I flew completely flat to a meeting with 27 ambassadors. I flew back and I went to bed for 12 weeks. And I'm just incredibly grateful to the doctors, Dr. Melville and the nursing staff at Constantia for getting me back on my feet again. Yeah, we're joined live in studio today, uh, but firstly by about 50 Cape Talk listeners. Wonderful to have you all with us today, but also by my special guest, Lewis Pugh, who's been chatting to us about uh, successful efforts to see the Ross Sea in Antarctica declared the biggest marine protected area in the world. And in fact, it's the biggest protected reserve on land or sea anywhere in the world. And he's hoping that it's about to get even bigger as he goes back in a few weeks' time. Before we get to that part of the story, though, we've got a few more questions from our audience. Clive, lovely to put a face to Clive and Fairways, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm Clive from Fairways. Uh, Lewis, I read your book, and in the book you make mention of the two temperatures. And I would like you to explain maybe to us here what is the significance around the core temperature, especially in the book you talk about the fire that you had to make inside your body mm -hmm. to be able to survive in the cold waters uh, at the North Pole. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Clive. So, so, so just to explain... Before we started doing these swims in very, very cold waters, we didn't know how a human re would respond. So no human had ever swum in, in water of minus 1.7 before. And so Tim Noakes from the Sports Science Institute, he said, Lewis, he said, I want to test what's going to happen. So we built a special swimming pool down at the waterfront. Uh, I and Jade, the fish company, kindly donated lots of ice. So when the fish come in from the South Atlantic, they've got an ice making facility there. They gave us a ton and a half of ice every day. And then we took my body and I dived into a small pool and every day we took the temperature down just one degree. So we started I think at 14 degrees and I just swam a kilometer. The next day down to 13 to 12 to 10, okay, until we got to five. At five, it was just extraordinarily cold. There's something happens when you go from five to four. And eventually we got down to one degree. And what they began to notice was that just before I'd get into the water, my core body temperature would actually rise, which is, which is not normal. Uh, and Tim, being the scientist, he said, Lewis, he said, um, this, is, this is 
anticipate you're, you're creating heat before an event. This is anticipatory thermogenesis. And then, <laughs> and then he wrote an article about it in uh, one of the big science uh, magazines. And he said, you know, Lewis can raise his core body temperature by this anticipatory thermogenesis. And then I started getting questions from journalists all over the world. Lewis, if you're standing waiting for, the, for, for a bus in London and you're cold, <laughs> you know, can you raise your core body temperature? And then there were other journalists calling from America, you know, I understand you've got this condition called anticipatory. I, I think people misunderstand it. Before I get into the water, I'm terrified. And when you're terrified your core body temperature is going to rise. It's just a simple fear mechanism. I'm sure that I'm not unique. People say, oh, Lewis, you're unique. I don't think I am, okay? It's just a, a, a reaction to the fear, and, 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 my, and, I, and I get he heated up. Now, I go from 37 up to 38.5, just a two-degree rise, and you're hyperthermic, down two degrees, and you're hypothermic. So that's 1.5 degree rise in body temperature is absolutely crucial for me. I'm like a furnace before I get into the water. Can I just ask a follow-up um, to do with your gear? Because you swim in just a Speedo goggles and a cap. Mm. Is there a particular reason that you swim in such stripped-down kit? Yeah, yes. Um, it, it, it's simple. I'm, I'm using swimming to try and convey a message about what's happening to the environment. And... I'm trying to get world leaders to be courageous. Some of them feel that the decisions which they have to make to protect the environment are so radical that they'll lose their electorate. Okay? I'm asking them for, to be courageous. I'm asking them to make decisions not on behalf of the electorate, but on behalf of our children and our grandchildren. Not on behalf of humans, but also on behalf of the animal uh, kingdom. And these require courageous decisions. Okay, if I'm asking for them to be courageous, I must also be courageous. There's a second reason. Obviously, if you swim across the North Pole in a pair of Speedos, it's going to make front page coverage. Yeah. It's, it's that simple. So it was a, a calculated decision uh, mm. to do it like that. Thank you. I know we had another audience question. My name is Erica from Brea River. Um, I had some other questions, but I really want to know this. It has been very noticeable how focused you are in this interview, how your energy is so co dedicated. I'm not even sure if you're looking Pippa pip in the eye, you're so focused. And I wanted to know if you are always like this or, or if, it's, if it's just because you're on the radio. Um, some people may think I'm always like this. You, you know, I, focus is an important thing, you know. Uh, so when it comes to my campaigning, uh, I get requests every single day to do uh, work on various issues. So whether it be climate change, whether it be uh, pollution, whether it be elephants, uh, lots, there's so many different environmental issues around the world. And I made a decision, and that is that I would just deal with ocean issues. I'm a maritime lawyer, I'm a swimmer, I'm in the oceans. And so I focus entirely on one subject, and then try and really try to be effective on that. I think if you're a voice for everything, you soon start becoming a voice for nothing. And so that focus which I have in my environmental campaigning, I try to also take into interviews so that I, I see where Pippa's questions are coming from and I just want to, to really answer them head on. Can I be unfocused? Um, I'm, I'm, I think I'm naturally a focused person, but you know sometimes I do swims which are very long in warm water, and then I totally zonk out. And so then I just zombie out, and I swim for day after day after day, just dreaming about absolutely nothing. And that's also very pleasant. <laughs> I want to bring you back to something you said a moment ago about making decisions on behalf of children and grandchildren. Mm. Some of the decisions we're making are, are, we used to think they were on behalf of children and they no longer are. They're needed now on our behalf. The very fact that you were able to swim across the North Pole, mm. which should be under ice, mm. tells us that. Um, is that something uh, that you've had to, to hammer home to say to, to world leaders? This is no longer about something for the sake of generations to come. Uh, I guess it's linked to the question that's coming on the SMS asking you to explain why it's so important that fishing be banned in the Ross Sea. What is the immediate threat? Uh, j just to explain, if, if you look in all the world's oceans, so the Atlantic, the Indian, the Pacific Ocean, 
90% of the world's big fish have been taken out now. And that's happened, so 90% of the big fish have been taken out of the world's oceans, and that's happened because of industrial fishing. The last big fish left in the world are up in the polar regions. So they're up in the Arctic and down in Antarctica. And down in Antarctica, there's a big fish called the Antarctic toothfish, uh, which these big industrial fishing fleets go down, they catch them, they rename them, rebrand them as Chilean sea bass, and then they sell them in high-end restaurants in America and, and in Europe. Why is it important to protect this region? Because if you don't protect it, it's going to go the exact same way as all the other oceans. And we know what, you know, we know what the end result is going to be. Mm. We're also facing a significant food security issue. You know, fish provide food for millions and millions of people around the world as a basic form of protein. If it all goes, and if we don't conserve this resource, it'll be gone. Joining us for the final quarter hour of our live studio audience today was with Lewis Pugh. He's uh, been talking to us about his swimming in cold water. He's been talking to us about efforts to secure the protection of the Ross Sea and Antarctica and the planet in general. And uh, before we go to our questions from the audience, Rodney's just emailed me. He heard you talking about zoning out uh, sometimes, particularly when swimming in warmer water. Many people, says Rodney, when experiencing that optimum level of functioning, also go into their zone. His question is, when you're in the zone, where do you go? <laughs> <laughs> These swims are short. So, that, for example, the swim across the North Pole was 18 minutes and uh, 50 seconds. Uh, you'd be very, very surprised if you don't focus where your mind is going to go. Uh, the Inuit people, so the people who live in, in, in the Arctic region, they talk about there being two wolves in your head. Always two wolves good wolf and a bad wolf. Mm -hmm. Which wolf is going to win? It's a wolf which you feed. So there's one wolf which is saying to me, Lewis, you've trained really hard. Lewis, you've got the best team with you. Lewis, you've got Tim Noakes there. And Lewis, if you're successful, maybe you're going to be able to, to persuade some world leaders to really, really try and tackle climate change successfully and try and create change. There's another wolf which says, Lewis, are you really sure about that? Mm -hmm. Have you done enough training? It's 4.5 kilometers to the bottom of the ocean. And are you sure that you're going to be alive at the end of the swim? And even if you are alive, do you really think that you're going to be able to persuade any of these world leaders? And that battle will always, always rage. And you will never, ever be able to completely stamp out that bad wolf. Okay? The only way that you can get the good wolf to win is by 100% focus. So as soon as a bad wolf, you hear that wolf rummaging around in your mind, you've got to get that wolf out. And the only way you can do that is by constantly thinking good, positive thoughts, trying to get to the next 100 meter mark and then to the next 100 meter mark, and then just keep on going all the way till the end. Sounds like me doing my first park run a few weeks ago, except the difference is I was going, you just got to run for four more telephone poles and then you can stop and walk for a while. <laughs> Let's take some questions from the audience. Hi, I'm Claire from Woolsley. And I wanted to ask you, who is going to patrol the reserve? Will there be serious consequences for people caught fishing in the reserve? And who will implement those consequences? Great question. Okay, so th this is a very interesting point. The, the marine protected area in the Ross Sea, there are three scientific bases down there. There's an American scientific base, there's a New Zealand scientific base, and there's an Italian one which is closed because of uh, funding problems uh, happening in the EU at the moment. The reserve was proposed by America and New Zealand, and they have agreed to use their vessels uh, to patrol and to protect the place. The problem comes when you have a ship from another country, so not one of the Camelot countries, okay? Not one of those who have signed up to this deal that wants to sail in and fish. It's the high seas, and actually they are legally allowed to do that. But whether America and New Zealand will put so much pressure on them, time will tell. But I'm confident that the vast majority of nations are now going to adhere to this deal. Yeah. What is the balance of numbers on signatories versus non-signatories? So uh, there are 196 countries in the world. Mm. Most of them don't have big fishing fleets. Uh, there are 24 nations in the U European Union uh, who are signatories to it. The vast majority of those are big fishing countries. Thank you. Yeah. We had another audience question. Mr. Burtish. 
Hi, Greg Bertish here. Um, Lewis, you were my uh, life-saving instructor many, many years back at Clifton Lifesaving, and uh, you made us swim in freezing water <laughs> that I barely handled. Um, I just wanted you to explain and just give us some perception of, of what the, the difference is between the water that you're swimming and the water that most people here in Cape Town have experienced, like, you know, let's say Clifton or Landadna, so you can get a feel for how cold the water is. And then, sorry, another question is your swims are very short time-wise, but... I know that behind that you take, you, you've got a lot of prep and you've got to take a, a special team with you and it takes ages and ages to prep for that, uh, that incredible swim. So I just wanted to see how to get a bit more uh, understanding of how, how you do that and how, how much goes into planning these things. Thank you so much. Uh, great to see you again. Um, and congratulations on all your, your, your surfing achievements. It's, been, yeah, yeah. it's really, really been wonderful to see it, really. Uh, just in terms of cold water... Um, if you go and swim in the Olympic Games, they set the water temperature at 27 degrees centigrade. Okay, really? that's the water in which it is, is set every single Olympic Games. Uh, drop down to about 20, 24 degrees centigrade. That's Durban on a nice warm summer's day. Go to Musenberg on a nice summer's day. That's probably 18 degrees. Clifton, Landudno, Camps Bay on one of those days when you put your foot in there and the southeast has been going. I mean, it can be 10 degrees. It really can. Uh, but there's another world altogether. Go down to five, that's the temperature of the water into which the passengers of the Titanic jumped and perished. Mm -hmm. Fresh water freezes at zero. Uh, the Ross Sea is minus 1.7. Okay, now you think, okay, the difference between uh, zero and minus 1.7 is nothing. It's the difference between climbing Table Mountain and climbing Everest. When you go down to those very low temperatures, every single degree ratchets up the pain extraordinarily. Your second part of your question was preparation. The swims are, are to be honest, just a small part of it. The real preparation comes in trying to have the creativity to think of an idea which is going to try and, and, and create change. And you know that, you, and I, I'm constantly having ideas about, you know, what swim could I do to raise attention to a certain issue? And I probably have 10 or 20 ideas every single month, and I'm constantly thinking of them. And you know that you've got a good idea when it's not an aha moment, but it's a moment where you go, uh, why on earth did I not see that? Why did I not see the possibility that if I did a swim there, that'll make global attention and be able to hopefully transform things? And so the vast majority of my preparation is lying on my back, literally, and just trying to think, and then going to maps and looking at them, and then going away, and then watching inspirational movies, and then reading books about the great explorers and the great mountaineers, and then just trying to think of ideas constant ideas. There's obviously also the preparation that you have to do the physical training. So for this new expedition, which I'm just about to undertake, I've been training now for about uh, two months. Uh, and that's fairly full on. But the real, the real work is getting the idea. Hmm. Hmm. Let's talk about the new expedition before we run out of time. You head off in a couple of weeks' time back to Antarctica. What's, what's the plan? Well, this is the first time actually announcing it. So okay. uh, it's good to do it here at home. Um, Antarctica was discovered in 1820 by the Russian Admiral Bellinghausen. So obviously we're coming up to the 200-year anniversary. Uh, there are another three marine protected areas around Antarctica which are on the cards. The one is in East Antarctica. It's been pr proposed by the Australian government. There's one in the Weddell Sea. So if you sail straight down from South Africa, you, you will get into the Weddell Sea. Uh, that's been proposed by the German government. And there's one in the Antarctic Peninsula being proposed by the Chilean and Argentinian governments. If we carry on the same way as we've been going with the Ross Sea, it's 17 years per marine protected area. We just can't do that. So I'm, I'm uh, working together with another nine... Uh, Real powerful world leaders, uh, Nobel laureates, former heads of state, religious leaders, and we're going to be making a call for these areas to all be up in place by 2020. And to kick it off, I'm going to go for a swim. So, <laughs> so that's, I'm not going to tell you where we're going to go for a swim, but 
it's obviously in a very cold place. Yep. <laughs> a wee dip in a cold spot. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I must share with you some of the messages that are coming through on our SMS line, including a comment from Hilton and Takai saying that the people of this planet owe you a very big thank you. And in closing, I want to ask you where, where the this, this sense of your own responsibility to do this came from. You've stepped up and said, this is my mission and I'm going to make it my mission to do this, to draw the spotlight, to force people to look at what is happening. If you could trace that back to a root that, that, that sparked that idea or planted that, that ethos of standing up and being the one who would be courageous, where do you think it comes from? There have been lots of influences in my life. My, my father was at the first at British atomic bomb test. Um, his responsibility, so he was a surgeon, was to pick up all the dead animals afterwards. Mm. Every single holiday I was taken to a national park, Shishlui, Umfalozi, Kruger, and he always used to say, we'll only ever truly protect those things which we love. That was one influence. The second was I became a maritime lawyer. I was involved with some big litigation, the, a ship called the Exxon Valdez, which sank off Alaska. And then the last thing has been the swimming. So, you know, I've been swimming in the world's oceans now for 30 years. I've seen them change. I've got a choice, either to stand up and try and be a voice for it or just carry on. And I'm just not built that way. We're so glad you're not built that way. Uh, mm -hmm. Lewis, I mean, there, there are many messages of thanks, of recognition. What an incredible guy, a lesson in humility. That was groundbreaking work. I'm very proud to call you a South African, says one of the messages. Uh, and they continue. Uh, I want to say a huge thank you for being with us today and, and uh, especially for giving us the scoop on the new trip. And our very best wishes go with you as you head back south. Yeah. Uh, and I hope the next time we're sitting here chatting, we're chatting about a new reserve that encompasses so much more and that has been achieved so much more quickly than it has taken to get to the Ross Sea. So thank you for sharing the story with us and for being my guest today. Thank you very, very much. I'm sure there's a space for a round of applause from the audience and perhaps <laughs> we've got time for one more question. I think we can squeeze in one last question if anybody would like to ask anything or say anything about what you've heard today. I think Jackie in the front wants to make a comment. It's a very short one. I've got two small children, and they want to know how the closest you've got to a dangerous animal in the seas. <laughs> you've had people around you all the time, haven't you? You, 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 you know, a, um, up in the Arctic, you obviously got polar bears. Down south, you, you've got leopard seals, and you've got killer whales. Uh, an encounter between a human and a polar bear is a very, very serious situation. Polar bears can smell humans from 30 kilometers away. Polar bears, a big male polar bear is 750 kgs. They move at a tremendous pace. Uh, and an encounter between the two of them, between a human and a polar bear, is, is, is generally fatal. So I try to keep as far away from them as possible because I, I absolutely love them. Uh, down south, uh, it's leopard seals. I've been very close to leopard seals. They... They've got this split personality. They're extraordinary. One moment they'll kill an Adelie penguin, come swim underneath you and give it to you as a gift. The next moment they're trying to grab you by your foot and pull you down to the bottom of the ocean. They have this split personality. You don't know what type of day they're having. Uh, so I try to keep away from them as well. And the way to keep away from Adelie, from, from leopard seals, is keep well away from penguins because that's what they eat. So I look for areas without penguins and without polar bears. Yeah. I'm afraid that is where we have to wrap up the conversation. Lewis, it's been wonderful having you with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. To our audience as well, thank you.